Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. In this series of videos, I'll be responding to Justin Peters' video series called Clouds Without Water, the revised and updated version of his seminar called A Call for Discernment. In the first video, JP says that he was in the city of Campina Grande in Brazil and saw four or five Rama bumper stickers. A couple months ago when I was in Brazil, we were in uh, Campina Grande, Brazil, at a, at a conference, and I saw four or five cars just in driving around Campina Grande with Rama bumper stickers on the car. Rama is Kenneth Hagen's school. Phil, you know it well. Uh, Rama is that's that's his church and his school that he started and so Kenneth Hagen has a huge presence in in Brazil. He was amazed to see so many cars with Rama bumper stickers in a city of about 400,000 people. Apparently Justin doesn't realize that Campina Grande is where Rama Brazil has its headquarters. They have a large church there called Verbo de Vida or Word of Life and a school as well. Rama Brazil was started by Bud and Jan Wright in 1983, right after they graduated from Rama in Oklahoma. Now, I've been to Campina Grande, and I stayed with Bud and Jan for a couple of days, and it's amazing what they've accomplished. Bud couldn't speak a word of Portuguese when he left for Brazil. He was a country boy from Alabama, a truck driver before he got saved and called into the ministry. He could barely speak proper English. Jan used to say that his Portuguese was actually better than his English. They only had a few hundred dollars when they started out, and when they arrived in 1983, Brazil was a poor country that was still under a military dictatorship. Over 90% of the country was Catholic. Bud's only contact ended up flaking out on him, but he found somebody else to interpret for him and help him set up some meetings in the country's largest city of Sao Paulo. Over the next two years, he learned the language and became familiar with Brazil and its culture. In time, he had several churches established in different cities and ended up locating the ministry's base in Campina Grande. Today, they have several schools in Brazil that have graduated over 10,000 people and have established more than 100 churches throughout the country, and less than 80% of the country is now Roman Catholic. Justin seemed to be under the impression that Kenneth Hagen did all of this, but basically all he did was provide Bud and Jan the training that they needed to fulfill God's call on their lives in Brazil. After that, they put their faith to work, and God provided for their every need along the way. In this next clip, J.P. mocks Joel Osteen's take on why God struck John the Baptist's father Zacharias mute. You recall the account of the angel giving the announcement to Elizabeth that she and her husband Zechariah were going to give birth to John the Baptist. Remember this in Luke's Gospel? And when uh, Elizabeth received this news and she told it to her husband, remember Zechariah kind of scoffed at this a little bit. He, he questioned it a little bit because they were advanced in years for a very interesting take on why uh, God, remember what God did in response. He closed Zechariah's mouth. For a very interesting take on why God closed Zachariah's mouth, this from Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen says this, Why did God take away his speech? It's because God knew that Zachariah's negative words would cancel out his plan. See, God knows the power of our words. He knows that we prophesy our future. And he knew Zachariah's own negative words would stop his plan. Wow. So according to Joel Osteen, God was up in heaven looking down and he saw Zechariah making negative confessions and God just went into a panic. Oh my goodness, what, what am I ever going to do? I, I wasn't counting on this. And so in a last ditch effort to save his plan of redemption, God had to reach down and close Zechariah's mouth and make him a mute. Whew, boy, that was a close one. First of all, you notice J.P.'s technique of adding to what Joel said, the part about God going into a panic and breathing a sigh of relief. This is what we call a straw man argument, making your opponent's viewpoint easier to attack by misrepresenting it. What Joel Osteen was saying here is essentially what the noted Bible commentator Matthew Henry said about the passage. 
Now in striking him dumb, God dealt justly with him, because he had objected against God's word. Hence, we may take occasion to admire the patience of God and his forbearance toward us, that we, who have often spoken to his dishonor, have not been struck dumb, as Zacharias was, and as we had been if God had dealt with us according to our sins. God dealt kindly with him, and very tenderly and graciously, for, first, thus he prevented his speaking any more such distrustful, unbelieving words. If he has thought evil, and will not himself lay his hands upon his mouth, nor keep it as with a bridle, God will. It is better not to speak at all than to speak wickedly. Now let's see what John Calvin had to say about this. And behold, thou shalt be dumb. It was suitable that this kind of punishment should be inflicted on Zacharias, that being dumb, he might await the fulfillment of the promise, which instead of interrupting it by noisy murmurs, he ought to have heard in silence. Faith has its silence to lend an ear to the word of God. So as you can see, Joel Osteen isn't the only one who sees a connection between Zacharias' unbelieving words and the fact that he was struck dumb as a result. Matthew Henry and John Calvin stated that Zacharias should have kept his mouth shut instead of interrupting the promise by speaking unbelieving words. In this next clip, J.P. quotes Kenneth Hagin as saying that Adam could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. And according to Kenneth Hagin, Adam could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, direct quote, toe-to-toe -to -toe and have no consciousness of inferiority whatsoever. He claimed that this was a direct quote, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Now, toe-to-toe -to -toe is usually a reference to combatants or contestants of equal strength. So if Kenneth Hagin said that Adam could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, he would have been saying, essentially, that Adam could hold his own against God in any confrontation, which is kind of hard to believe. Well, I scoured the internet looking for a source for that quote, and I came up empty. What I did find, however, was where Kenneth Hagin said that man, or Adam, was created on terms of equality with God and could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. This was in his book, Zoe, The God Kind of Life. What Brother Hagin was saying is that man was unique among God's creation because he could fellowship with God as a spiritual being, terms of equality, and didn't run and hide from God like he did after the fall, consciousness of inferiority. He didn't say he could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God in that book. Maybe I should let you know a bit about my background here. My first blog was a successful effort to expose some investment scammers by finding out their real names and showing people that they weren't exactly trustworthy. I accomplished this through the use of advanced search techniques that I won't go into. Suffice it to say that if the information is out there, I can usually find it. If I can't find a source for this quote, my guess is that he didn't say it. I certainly never heard him say it, and apparently nobody else has either, or some anti-word of faith person would have posted it somewhere. And I could be wrong, and if I am, I'll admit it. But I don't think I am. So I'm calling on Justin Peters here. Provide your source for that toe-to-toe -to -toe quote. If you can't do that, you need to offer a public retraction. If you can't provide a satisfactory source for the quote or offer a retraction, we'll have to conclude that you're lying. The next clip has JP saying that there's no prosperity gospel. And by the way, there are no adjectives to the gospel. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no social gospel. If you have to add an adjective to the gospel, you got a different gospel. There's just the gospel. Well, in this case, I have to agree that there's no prosperity gospel, but what JP doesn't tell you is that prosperity gospel is what Word of Faith opponents call Word of Faith theology. Nobody in the movement calls it that. It's like saying trickle-down economics instead of supply-side economics. Trickle-down is what the opponents call it. The economic terminology is supply-side economics, which is an alternative to demand-side economics or Keynesian economics, which emphasizes more federal spending in order to increase demand for goods and services. By calling Word of Faith theology the prosperity gospel, Justin Peters is only attacking the terminology 
used by his own crowd against Word of Faith theology rather than attacking terminology used within the Word of Faith movement. This is the theological equivalent of Don Quixote attacking windmills. After this, we see JP insisting that we're promised persecution in this life rather than money or healing. But on this earth, you're not promised money. You're not promised healing. What are we promised? We're promised persecution, right? What does the Bible say? Some of those who live godly in Christ Jesus may be persecuted. Is that what it says? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, it's true that we're promised persecution, but persecution doesn't mean sickness or poverty. It means opposition and discrimination from those who don't share your viewpoint. You know, like people making up lies about what you believe and teach, that kind of thing. Nobody in the Word of Faith denies the reality of persecution, but there's nowhere in the Bible that we read all who live godly in Christ Jesus will go through life sick and broke. In this next clip, JP accuses Creflo Dollar and others of teaching Arianism. Many of the faith preachers have what is essentially an Arianistic view of Christ. This from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says, and somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus came as a man. And at age 30, God is now getting ready to demonstrate to us and give us an example of what a man with the anointing can do. So Creflo Dollar says it's simply because Jesus was asleep in the boat and God never sleeps nor slumbers and therefore Jesus could not have been God. That's ridiculous. Jesus came as the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. And as the God-man, Jesus experienced many of the same things that you and I experience. He got hungry. He got thirsty. And guess what? He got sleepy. It does not mean that he was not God. But this is Arianism. This is a, this is a Arianism 2.0. First of all, we should probably define Arianism for those who aren't familiar with the word. Word of Faith opponents often throw words like Gnosticism, Shamanism, Dualism, and Arianism around in their accusations without defining them, because if they were to actually define them, it would be painfully obvious to everyone that such concepts aren't taught in the Word of Faith. Arianism was the belief that Jesus became the Son of God at a certain point in time, but that he didn't always exist prior to that as a member of the Godhead. That's not what Creflo Dollar was saying. He believes in the orthodox position concerning the Trinity that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who became a man in order to redeem fallen man. What Creflo Dollar was saying in this quote was that Jesus functioned as a man dependent on the Holy Spirit for guidance and empowerment rather than functioning as God. This isn't a denial of his deity or eternal sonship. It's an acknowledgment of his humanity, and thus his need to rely on the Holy Spirit's anointing in his life and ministry. Once again, J.P. is misrepresenting a Word of Faith teacher in order to brand him a heretic. After this, J.P. says this about Word of Faith adherence. You may as well be a Mormon. You may as well be a Jehovah's Witness. You may as well be... A Muslim is to be word of faith. So according to Justin Peters, I am just as far from God as a JW, a Mormon, or a Muslim. Even though I hold to all of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, original sin, justification by faith, a virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, a literal heaven for the righteous, a literal hell for the unrighteous, the second coming of Christ, repentance from dead works... Because I hold to a theology that doesn't tickle his fancy, I'm on a highway to hell. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up Southern Baptist in North Texas. My pastor, who baptized me when I was eight, was Dr. Landrum P. Level II, who went on to become the president of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I went to Sunday school. I went to training union on Sunday nights. I went to Royal Ambassadors on Wednesday nights. I sang in the choir. I went to vacation Bible school in the summer. 
So I got pretty good Baptist credentials. When I was 17, I began attending an Assembly of God church with some friends of mine from school, and I started learning Pentecostal theology there. At 19, I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and from that point on, I was pretty much persona non grata with the Baptists. My Assembly of God pastor was Carl Alcorn, who had previously pastored in Dallas and Fort Worth in the 1940s and the 1950s. He had Kenneth Hagin speak at his church back before the Word of Faith movement began. He also knew Gordon Lindsay, who founded Christ for the Nation's Bible Institute in Dallas. He gave me several books by Gordon Lindsay, and one of them was called How You Can Be Healed. And the last chapter of that book was written by Kenneth Hagin. It's called How to Turn Your Faith Loose and Receive Your Healing. That's how I know that the Word of Faith movement did not come out of the metaphysical cults or new thought as Justin Peters and others have claimed. It came from Pentecostalism. We had people healed in that Assembly of God church because Brother Alcorn preached faith in a living God who would actually show up and do miracles if we would believe. Now, I have a very solid background in theology. I know the essentials. I know about apologetics, theology, exegesis, hermeneutics, philosophy, etc. And having graduated from Kenneth Hagin School, I'm also very familiar with what is taught in the Word of Faith. And nothing they teach violates any essential doctrines. Sure, there are extremes in the Word of Faith movement, just like every other movement throughout church history. Do a little study on what Luther and Calvin believe sometime. There are people who teach error, but not error that violates the fundamental doctrines of the faith, as far as I know. If I were to hear denials of the deity of Christ or other essentials, I'd be the first person to protest. But I don't hear that. I hear people saying things I don't agree with and that I don't think are too smart to say, like the little gods claim. But even then, I know that they're not saying what the critics claim, and they're not claiming that we possess or can possess any of God's divine attributes. The problem is, Word of Faith opponents haven't been where I've been, and they end up cherry-picking quotes out of context, or just making quotes up, in order to build a straw man that they can attack. But that's not what we're supposed to be doing as believers. If I wanted to, I could do the same thing, but my conscience won't allow me to do that. So Justin Peters can rant and condemn all he wants, but he's not my judge. And as I've already established through several videos, he doesn't really know what he's talking about anyway. So he doesn't faze me one bit. In the next video, we'll discuss the second video entitled Mangled Manifestations. Thanks for watching.